Welcome to church for this exciting service. We are so glad you chose to be with us today. We are anticipating what the Lord will do in our hearts today through the singing, the special music, and Bible preaching. On the way in, you should have received a service guide where you can find the sermon notes, today's program, and a list of upcoming events. If this is your first time visiting with us, head to manteca.church slash connect so we can send you a gift for being our first time guest. Thank you so much for being with us today at CVBC. Good evening. Welcome to church on this Sunday night. Would you stand, please? And we'll sing this good song. In my heart, there rings a melody. I have a song that Jesus gave me. Song 572, if you want to use the book. Let's sing it together on the first now. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. Then ever was a sweeter melody. Aren't you glad for the day Jesus spoke your name, called you out, saved your soul? This might be a new one for some of you. 528, if you want to get the book, if you want to help yourself. Yeah, sing a country style, Pastor. That's right. This is a, a good down-home style song here. Jesus spoke to me one day. 528, if you want to see the words, the melody on the chorus switches between a couple of different parts. You'll figure it out. It's a lot of fun. Here we go. Let's try it on that first. Jesus spoke to me one day. Jesus spoke to me one day. Praise his holy name. I know it's a tough one. 528. You'll see all the notes moving around, and at least you look like you know what you're doing. It'll be fun. 520 on the second. I shall not forget the day. Here we go. Ready? I shall not forget the day when I heard his voice. Said my sins were washed away, made my soul rejoice. It is finished, thus for me. I have paid it all. Sweet relief it was to me.
today. How does he do it? Through God's word divine. How many have sat in a service and God said, yep, that's for you right there. And God knocks on your heart's door. Hear what Jesus has to say to your soul and mind. Cease your struggle and your strife. Look to him and live. He alone can give new life. Gladly he will give. Tonight when we're at church, I want to hear him tonight. I want to hear him speak to me and call me and say, hey, Chris, that's what I want you to do. I want that tonight. I know you do too. Sing about it on that last Jesus calls to you today. Jesus calls to you today through God's word divine. Hear what Jesus has to say to your soul and mind. Cease your struggle and your strife. Look to him and live. He alone can give new life. Gladly he will give. Oh yes, Christ Jesus spoke to me. song. Wasn't that fun? Jesus speaks to us, and he will speak to you tonight. I'm glad you're here. Central Valley Baptist Church, we're so glad to see you tonight at our evening service. Who in the room tonight is cold? Anybody cold in here? And uh, Brother uh, Easter Day, would you help me with that? I think everyone's a little cold. I see people shivering. I see meat hanging in the back. And uh, how many of you men in the room, you're just right. You're happy. Now, that's me. I, I said to Brother Asper, I said, Brother, are you cold? He said, I'm perfect. I said, you are perfect, aren't you? You know? <laughs> And thank you for being here. Looking forward to the service. Wonderful music planned. And I hope your heart just is lifted up in worship to the Lord. Uh, This morning, we honored our veterans. We're so grateful for veterans. Amen. We're thankful for those that serve our country. We have one guest tonight who I met. And and, uh, I'm so thankful that uh, those that serve, serve. And Brother uh, Tam, Ken Tam, and Rob Ehrlich gave wonderful addresses to our military today. And if you're here tonight, before you leave, we have a gift for you we'd like to give you and just thank you for serving our country. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help tonight. Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, that you do speak to us. Lord, when I hear that song, I I think about the fact you speak to me all the time. Sometimes you tell me I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be. Sometimes you speak to me and it's a word of encouragement or peace or comfort. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you speak to me through the preaching of God's word. You speak to me through the music that we sing. You speak to me through your word and in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Lord, I pray tonight as we hear the choir sing and and others that sing tonight, Lord, I pray that it would encourage our hearts. Lord, as we focus on biblical worship and what the purpose of that is. And Lord, we are going to talk tonight about it being an act of uh, love to you and an act of devotion to you. And Lord, we come to you tonight and we worship you. And may our hearts grow closer to you in that worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
excuse me, 504. To be used of God is my desire. I hope you sing this song with your heart tonight. Brother Chris, would you come lead us on this song? I have a yearning in my heart on that first. Love 
aren't you thankful his love is always there? Amen. And that's a wonderful song. Thank you for singing that, ladies. Uh, if you're a guest tonight, if you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time, we're grateful for to have you in our service. In the seat in front of you there, there's a little blue card that says welcome. And if you'll just jot your name down, we'd love to know where you came from, how you heard about our church, and like to get a chance to meet you. Uh, I was so privileged this morning. We had a guest in the first service, the 830 service, and first time ever here and he didn't know that we were, I don't think he didn't know we were going to honor veterans today, and it was a blessing. He was a veteran himself and got a chance to talk to him, and he was very grateful for that with tears in his eyes. He said, thank you for doing that today, and that was such a blessing. Thank you, church, for uh, having a heart for that, and uh, we also had a guest in the second service as well, a guest tonight, and we're so grateful for that, that you'd come in. I tell you, uh, how many have ever been to a church for the first time? That's a trick question you all have, amen? And it's not easy going into a church for the first time or not knowing anybody, and I appreciate you being here, and I hope the service is a blessing. Ushers, you have those service guides. You can come on forward with those, and we'll make sure everybody gets those tonight. I am preaching a message that is a doctrinal message. Hopefully, it'll be a a help to you. And if you need one of these, slip up your hand. We'll get you one right now. It's the sermon notes, really, is what it is. And uh, we'll talk about biblical worship here in just a few minutes. Last week, we talked about what biblical worship is. We'll review that a little bit, and then we'll talk about tonight the purpose of biblical worship and why we worship as a church family. I want to ask you to continue to pray for our building program. I just want to give you a quick update on that. Met with the deacons this last Saturday and talked a little bit about this next phase of our church. We're entering in what's called the schematic phase this week. And you say, what's the schematic phase? And basically what it means is they're going to take this, uh, the plans that we've drawn up, the, floor, the, uh, uh, the, the footprint of the building, the different things that we've already done, and we're going to actually put that into official uh, plans. And so they're going to do official drawings of the floor plans, all the seats, which way is the door swinging out, the kind of lights that are going to be in the rooms, and is there going to be a sink in this room, and all these different things. And so they're really going to flesh out the floor plan of the church, and then also there's 30% of the civil engineering is going to be drawn, and that's, uh, of course, the drainage and the, all that stuff on our property, the, the, the traffic flow, the parking lot, and all those things is going to be drawn. And so what this schematic phase will be is about 50% of our total plans. And so that's a $120,000 contract, and, uh, and so that's about 50% or so of what we've committed, about 30 or 40% of what we committed to the total drawings. And so uh, how many have ever seen a full set of construction drawings? And they're about this big around. And so a lot of work still yet to be done, but this phase will get us uh, into that next phase. They've given us a timeline, and if we follow through the timeline and everything goes smoothly through the county, which is going to take prayer and fasting, but if everything goes smoothly through the county, we have about uh, two years uh, from now, from, from basically this week, for the completion of the building. And wouldn't that be amazing? God will allow us to do that. And so please continue to pray for that and ask God to bless that whole process. It's a, it's a lot of fun, but boy, it's a lot of work, let me tell you. And so if you continue to pray for that and ask God to bless, I mentioned uh, this past Wednesday night, I also mentioned in men's prayer breakfast on Saturday uh, we are praying for a grant. It's called the J.C. Lasco Grant, and a man who owned the largest tool and dye company in America was a, was a Baptist, and he passed away and left uh, money to churches, in his words, to soul-winning churches, churches that are going after people and telling them about Christ. And guess who we are? That's who we are. And so we've applied for that. We've been accepted into the first phase, and we're now in the second phase of that. The deacons have been informed and, and know all of that, the finance department. And so would you please pray for that? That would be a huge uh, blessing. That would allow our church, if God would do that for us, it would allow our church to build almost completely debt-free. And uh, how many say that would be nice? And I believe that would bring honor and glory to God, and it's all up to Him. I, I, uh, whether He allows that to happen or not is completely up to him. And I'm, we're leaving it in his hands, but we should always ask. And that's what we do. We ask, we ask for these things and pray and ask and for God's will to be done. I want to say thank you to the church family for your spirit of giving. We have such a wonderful, uh, generous church. And I say that a lot, but I really mean it. And those of you that are watching online that give, I, we have uh, probably about 10 families uh, that cannot come to church for various reasons. They're homebound, sick, different things, and yet they every single week they give. And there are families that do not even attend our church, that don't even live. Some don't even live in California. Some don't even live in the United States. 
that give to our church every single week, every single month. And I just want to say that's a huge compliment. We want to thank you. And we, we, uh, we want you to know that your uh, giving goes towards winning the lost. Uh, this uh, yesterday, I think it was yesterday. Where's Brother Galang? Is he in the room? And Brother Galang, was it yesterday you went to Salida or was that today? Yesterday, they went to Salida to a um, retirement home and, and a group went there and sang and they gave the gospel. And two people accepted Christ there. Amen. One of them was the director of the nursing home. And so that's a huge blessing. And I was so excited by that. He shared that with me. And I want to say thank you to those that do that. And uh, that's what our church is all about, is just getting the gospel out, whether it's through missions or locally here, different areas that we try to do that. And so thank you for your spirit and generosity. Ushers are making their way forward tonight. And so I want to say thank you to you for that. And we had a wonderful month last month, and let's continue to be faithful. Can you believe, though, can you believe that Thanksgiving is almost here? Yep. I'm talking about turkey, baby. I'm talking about billowy mounds of mashed potatoes and gravy. I'm talking about all sorts, all sundry sorts of pies. I'm talking about yams with, uh, with toasted marshmallows on it and butter dripping down the side. Mrs. Cooney, she made something for the pump, for the, or did you make that, Bob? Those little, those little round things for the pumpkin. That was you. That was, that was like, that, that will send you to another universe. I'm just telling you. Um, I, I'm just looking forward to Thanksgiving. Amen. And so um, can you believe that, how quickly time flies? It's going to be 2022 before we know it. And so let's be faithful. Amen. Father, I pray that you bless the offering now as we take it. Thank you, Lord, for your people. And thank you for the generosity of those that give. We love you, Lord. And this we know. We know that this is an act of worship as we draw close to you in the area of giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. stand together. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. Remember when you first started out serving the Lord, you thought, wow, I didn't know God could use me to do this. And now God used you all these years. What God allows us to do for him is incredible. Since I started for the kingdom, sing it on that first verse together. 492 feet in the book. Since I started for the kingdom, since my second now. Every need he is supplying plenteous grace he bestows every day my way gets brighter the longer I serve him the sweeter he grows. On the course lift it up now Yeah. Uh-huh. 
you may be seated. What a song tonight, amen? And certainly we know, Brother Renison, that that heart is such a wonderful thing to hear, his heart when he sings. Please take your Bibles and go to John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4. Boy, my heart is full from the music of of today, from the service this morning and tonight. And I appreciate all the work that goes into that, Brother Russell and and all the singers and Brother Asprelli, his work with the choir. It's just a blessing. Thank you for praying for my mother-in-law. She, for those of you that uh, or maybe new or don't know, she fell and she went to the hospital. Now she's home and the doctors let her go home. She's still going through some things. You please keep praying for her. And of course, my father-in-law as well. And pray for her because of my father-in-law. Amen. I'm just kidding. If you're watching dad there at home, I'm just teasing. And John chapter number four, John chapter number four. And so tonight, uh, I just, it was a two-part series. I began this uh, series. It's not a long series, just two messages. Last week, we talked about what is biblical worship. What is biblical worship? And tonight, we're going to talk about the purpose of biblical worship. And so we know that the purpose of biblical worship is an act of worship. And what does that act of worship do? And so if you're in John, look at verse 23. Look at what Jesus, of course, I love this. I wish I could get into uh, the story here of what Jesus is doing. And he's meeting with the woman at the well. And how many of the woman at the well is one of your favorite stories in Scripture? And so Christ is talking to her, and they're talking about worship. Verse 23, and Jesus says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And for the Father seeketh such 
to worship Him. Notice, in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And several weeks ago, I preached this message on biblical worship. I'm having you sit because I have a long introduction, and then I'll pray, a longer introduction. Two weeks ago, we preached the message, what is biblical worship? And hopefully this, that message answered in our hearts what biblical worship is. And specifically, we talked a little bit about music uh, last uh, two weeks ago. We talked about how music has a role to play in our worship. Not all worship is music. Worship is an expression, excuse me, music is an expression of worship. And so we gave three truths about biblical worship. Number one, true worship is in harmony with the Spirit of God. This is all review. Worship, true worship, is in harmony with the Spirit of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As you heard Brother Renison singing, as you heard those young ladies and Mrs. Dossery, that group singing, and as we heard the choir singing, and as we heard the ensemble sing this morning, as, the, as we sang together as a congregation, the Spirit of God ought to be in harmony with what's coming out of your mouth. And the Spirit of God ought to be in harmony with what you're hearing. And so we recognize that, that it's in harmony with the Spirit of God. Colossians 3.16, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We define what psalms and hymns and spiritual songs are. Psalms, the Jewish people would know very well. Melodies set to the words written in the book of Psalms. And some of those psalms we even sing today. Uh, We know that hymns are songs that give praise, honor, and thanksgiving to God. Unlike psalms, hymns are not inspired. That blue book there under the seat in front of you is not the inspired word of God. It's a hymn book that has songs in it that we sing that glorify God and bring praise to Him. And then there's spiritual songs. This term is more general, and believers are to express their faith in song. And so oftentimes we sing all kinds of different songs, spiritual songs that express our emotions. That's joy of our salvation. We think about the grace of Christ, the greatness and power of God. I think about that song we sang tonight, Jesus Spoke to Me. I can't hear that song without thinking about Tony Hudson. If you don't know who Tony Hudson is, please don't look him up, all right? And so I'm just kidding. And he he just has that old Southern draw, Jesus spoke to me one day. And, you know, that's a spiritual song. That's a song that we think, okay, Jesus speaks to us. And while we understand, and I think we all understand, hopefully you're mature enough in your Christian walk to understand that there's preferences in music. Amen? There's preferences. Not everybody listens to the same thing in their car. Uh, Some people really like a certain kind of music they grew up with. And and some people, I was uh, in discipleship the other day, and, and the man's in the room tonight. We were talking about music. And he said, Pastor, he said, what, you know, kind of we're talking about what should I listen to, what should I listen to? And, and my answer to that is always the same. If it grieves the Spirit of God in you, you shouldn't listen to it. Amen. Amen. Uh, my dad and I, when we would work tile together as a young, a young person, a teenager, I would help my dad, and we would set tile together, and my dad would listened to uh, classical music all day, and I hated it. No, I'm just kidding. I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed listening to classical music, and, and you know, classical music isn't necessarily uh, Christian music, but, boy, it doesn't grieve my spirit to listen to Sebastian, Johann Sebastian Bach, you know. And, and so you understand what I'm saying. There's preferences in music. Uh, some of you might have Disney stuff in your car. Some of you might think, you know, Disney's of the devil. There's all kinds of different preferences. And all God's people said, amen, we don't need to be going through each other's stuff and saying, you shouldn't listen to that. And if it grieves your spirit, if it draws you farther from God, you should get rid of it. If it brings your spirit closer to God, it's something that you can definitely listen to. And so uh, that's kind of my answer to that, because there's a lot of different kinds of music. But in the church now, there's a specific uh, purpose for music. And the purpose in the church for music is not necessarily for our enjoyment, although we certainly enjoy it. It is for the worship of God. And so we talked about how that is uh, worship, biblical worship. Number two, true worship is inspired by a relationship with God. Uh, True worship. We, of course, understand that there is such a thing as pagan worship. And there are those that worship Satan. And there are those that would worship something opposite of God. Not all worship is good. 
And so since the fall of man, Satan has desired men to worship him. That's been his desire. His goal is to turn away the worship of mankind to, from God to himself. And so we must understand that there is a counterfeit worship. There is a worship that is not a godly worship. There is a worship that will draw our focus off of God and onto ourselves or onto something else. And so you and I, without being critical, we can certainly see a difference between the worship that we have in our church and the music of the world. And we certainly can see that, amen? And, and to take it even a little bit farther, we can certainly see that the worship in our church is different than some of the worship in other churches. And without being critical tonight, we have to understand what is the purpose of worship and why is there a difference? It's important to recognize that there is a worldly, fleshly kind of counterfeit worship out there, and then there's the worship that glorifies and honors God. Thirdly, we said that true worship is inspired by doctrinal truth. Doctrinal truth. I read two weeks ago, I read the song, uh, uh, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. And boy, it was a song just literally packed with doctrine. That song was written in 2013. It doesn't have to be old to be filled with doctrine. Amen? A lot of these psalms and hymns that we sing uh, in our hymn book, a lot of them are older songs, and some of them are newer songs. But they all have one thing in common. They are doctrinally rich. They should be doctrinally rich. Some of them are, are not as much doctrine focused, but they should have good doctrine in them. And so true worship is inspired by doctrinal truth. Our scripture tonight gives us a clear picture of that. John chapter number four. But the hour cometh and now is true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in what? And in truth. Those two things are very important, the spirit and the truth. God is a spirit, Jesus said, and they that worship him <clears throat> must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we determine that spiritual worship must be true and accurate according to the word of God. And so it must ring true doctrinally. Now tonight, we're going to go beyond what true worship is. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the purpose of biblical worship. Why do we worship? Why do we come together and sing? Why do we have a song service? Why do we sing corporately? Why do we sing? Uh, uh, why do we have special music? Why do we give in the offering? Why do we serve in the church? Why do we worship? What is the purpose of worship? And so that's the message tonight. Longer introduction, but let's have our prayer. And uh, the message is uh, uh, hopefully be an encouragement. Father, I pray tonight that you'd help us with this message. And Lord, help us as we learn the purpose of true worship, true biblical worship. Help us, God, tonight, first of all, to be focused on you and you alone in our worship. Lord, may our worship for you not be about us, not be about the other people that we worship with, but Lord, we'll be directed to and focused on you. Lord, speak to our hearts tonight and help us, Lord, to have understanding in this area. May we as a church, Lord, always, always be a church that worships you and directs our praise towards you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. By the way, I recognize it's an hour later than it normally is on a Sunday night. And so you're probably ready to, uh, to uh, go to bed already, but I'll try to keep things within line. You're going to leave here and go eat it in and out anyways. But anyway, um, <clears throat> why do we worship? What's the purpose of true worship? Speaking of Johann, Johann Sebastian Bach, he said this, all music should have no other end and aim than the glory of God and the soul's refreshment. Where this is not remembered, there is no real music but only a devilish hubbub. The heading of all of Johann Sebastian Bach's compositions is the uh, initials J.J, which means Jesus Juva, which is translated Jesus, help me. At the end of every of Johann Sebastian Bach's composition is the initials SDG, which stands for Soli Dia Gracia, which means to God alone be the glory. Why do we sing? Why do we attend church? Why do we worship the Lord together? Why do we give? Why do we perform these acts of worship? Eugene Peterson said this, and when I first heard this quote, it took me a while to grapple with it, but then after thinking about it for a while, it made sense. Worship is an act that develops 
feelings for God, not a feeling for God that is expressed in an act of worship. Now, let me say that again. Worship is an act that develops feelings for God, not a feeling for God that is expressed in an act of worship. Now, I tend to think that it's both. I think that an act of worship does indeed develop our feelings towards God. And I also believe that worship can be and is an expression of a feeling that we have towards God. When I sing, boy, I sing to the, you can't hear me up here, hopefully. I'm singing to the top of my lungs. Why? Because I love God. I want to, I love him. I want to sing towards him. And that ought to be, that ought to, his love ought to come out of us when we sing. Man, I sing, try to sing everywhere I go. Uh, I'll be in the restroom with all the guys and they're singing. And they're just like, what's, come on, pastor. We're, you know, and so we ought to have the love of God boiling out of us, so to speak. And certainly that's the case. But the, but the part, what he's saying here that I think is true is when we perform acts of worship, it certainly does draw our hearts closer to God. And this is one of the purposes of worship. Worship is an act that we do that will deepen our love for God. And so when we worship God, our worship should draw our hearts closer to Him. This is the purpose of worship. Let me give you three thoughts tonight. Let me give you three thoughts if you're taking notes. Number one, worship is an act of love for God. Worship is an act of love for God. Take your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter number 22. Matthew chapter 22. Is everybody all right tonight? Amen. I know you're tired. It's been a long day. And uh, the time change, I know that extra hour of sleep isn't mattering to you much right now. Matthew chapter number 22, look at verse 36. And Jesus uh, is here and he is speaking to the multitudes as he uh, liked, liked to do and did. And someone says to him, verse 36, Master, Uh, We know it's a lawyer. He says, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37, Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And read the next verse with me, verse 38. Ready, begin. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus said, and, and in the different gospels in Mark, we see that. That goes all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, where God said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. In the book of Mark, it says, with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment to love God. And listen, Christians, if there's anything you don't hear tonight and you're going to go and there's a lot of information, a lot of things I say, remember this. It is our supreme duty as Christians to love God. To love God, that is our supreme duty as Christians. To love Him, to love God, to have an uninhibited, unmarred, pure love for God. That ought to be our goal in worship. What does this mean? Jesus mentions loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind. Mark, he says, with all of our strength. This is the faculties of our mind, what we think about. We put our minds to work in worship. We put our minds to work as we write the songs of worship, as we write the poems of worship, as we write the Sunday school lessons, as we write those things, we put our mind to work in worship. This means that everything I do with my heart, that is my affection for God. Uh, When I sing to God, when I serve others for God, when I uh, do whatever I do for God, it's an act of worship. It's a love for God. Hey, when I give my strength, when I serve God, whether I'm pulling weeds out of the flower beds in the, in the parking lot or whether I'm scrubbing the sink in the restroom or whether I'm handing a, a service guide out to someone, I am showing God an active service of love for Him. This is our supreme goal in worship. This is why, this is why serving God is so important. When we put our minds to work, when we put our strength to work, this is why, because it increases our love for God. When you first get saved, you're in awe of His grace, aren't you? And I, am, I was too when I got saved. And when you come to Christ and you realize how, how, how you were a sinner, and boy, uh, those sins, and you, you recognize those things. By the way, Linnell over here, Linnell way back, got saved last Wednesday night. <laughs> Miraculously saved. And boy, what a, what a wonderful thing being saved is when you come to Christ and, and you recognize all those sins are washed away. I have a brand new start. I, I have grace and mercy. But boy, the love for God is developed over time. As you begin to serve God and you begin to 
worship him, you begin to develop that deep love for God. Where's Ben Greenhalgh? There you are. Ben, would you stand up for a second? I can pick on you. You were in my youth group. So, Ben, how long have you been married? Man, you had to think about that, didn't you? <laughs> Five months married. You still love each other? Okay, good. Um, ben and Diana went to our Christian school and grew up here at our church. Now they're married. And I can't believe she married you, but that's another story. Anyway, no, that's great. And Ben and Diana are married. Now, Ben, I want to ask you a question, okay? If you never spoke to Diana, if you never bought her flowers or a necklace or anything, every dinner you were gone, every anniversary you were gone, every special event you were gone, you never showed her any act of devotion at all, what do you think she would feel when you say with your lips, I love you? It's not going to fly, is it? I said, it's not going to fly, is it? Thank you, Ben. You can be seated. I think about a relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and wife. Boy, when you say that you love that person, there are some things that go along with that. There are some acts, A-C-T-S, not acts, (laughs) A-X-E. There are some acts that should go into that. When you say you love your wife, but you never tell her that you love her. You never, and with your mind and with your heart, you put into communication how much you love her. Maybe you explain to her why you love her or wives to the husband, how much you love him and why you love him. And you don't communicate that or you never do anything for each other. You never, uh, as a wife, you never do something for your husband that shows that you are, your, you are his wife and you love him or he loves as you as the husband. He does something for you. If there's no, there's no acts of love, there's no communication of love. And boy, when, when anniversaries roll around, your MIA, they're nowhere to be found. You forget about it. Uh, and you forget about Valentine's Day. And you forget about her birthday. And you forget about his birthday. And I'm, boy, I'm making some people feel real uncomfortable right now. And so, hey, but listen, here's, here's the thing. We can say all day long that you love your spouse, but the proof is in the pudding. And so, as a Christian, when we Worship God, these acts of worship. Not only are we saying with our mouth, I love God, but we are also drawing closer to Him in love. Isn't it true, husbands and wives, when you do something for your spouse, your heart is drawn closer to them? When you sit down and you write that card, your heart is drawn closer to them. When you, when you go out and you, you men, you poor men, and, and guys, I feel sorry for you, you go out to the mall and you're trying to find something to buy your wife. You know what I'm talking about? Thank God for Amazon. Can I get a witness there? I'll be here tomorrow, I hope. No, I'm just kidding. And so, uh, I'm just teasing. My, I'm, I'm lucky. My wife likes things that kill things, and so I get those things for her. And so, um, and so, when we as Christians, when we demonstrate worship, it draws our heart and it increases our love for God. For instance, attending church is worship. I said attending church is worship. You can't worship God on a boat. Oh, maybe you can, but but certainly we shouldn't ignore church for the boat. Attending church is worship. And your love for God increases when you're in church. Is it true? And the more you're in church, the more your love for God increases. The more faithful you are to the services of God's house, the more your heart is drawn closer to Him. Am I telling the truth? And the less you go to church and the less you spend time in God's house, your love for God diminishes. You can act like that's not true all day long, but, but I know how I am. And how about this? Witnessing to others is an act of worship. When I proclaim to others, I'm, obedient, I'm being obedient to the commission, but I'm also growing in my love for God. How about praying? Praying is an act of worship. When I pray, I'm speaking to God. He is speaking to me, but simultaneously I am growing in my love for God. Confessing and forsaking my sin is an act of worship. Hey, my sins are forgiven. I said, my sins are gone. They're not just under, they're gone. They're they're, they're nowhere to be found. My sins are forgiven, but an act of worship is confessing my sin so that I keep that fellowship sweet and I grow closer to God. Serving the Lord, serving Him is an act of worship. As I serve God, I learn to love Him more. Giving, I say, giving is an act of worship. When I give to God, I learn more about loving Him. 
Listen, every time we come to church, every time we serve, every time we give, every time we sing, every time we perform these acts of worship, our hearts grow closer to God. So often people treat worship as if it's some kind of selfish thing. They treat church as if not as an act of worship, but for some kind of selfish end. They don't come to church to worship God. They come to church to make friendships. They come to church or attend church to make connections. They come to church sometimes to build a business. Sometimes people come to church because it's a good babysitting service. Sometimes people come to church so that their youth group can make friends and have something to do. Sometimes people come to church to hear a motivational talk that will help them live their best life and all these things. And certainly some of those things do happen when you come to church. <laughs> you do make friends and you do make connections and hopefully uh, your, your teenagers will enjoy it and all these things. And those are positive things. But those are not the reasons why we worship. No, we worship because we love God. We go to church because we love God. Not because everyone else is doing everything that we want them to do. Not because we have a friend there. Not because, no, we worship because we love God. Because we love Him. And listen, if the seats were uncomfortable and if it was hot in this room, some wouldn't come because they don't come because they love God. They don't come because they want to worship God. They come because it pleases them. And may I say, That worship, the purpose is to love God. I think about Christians. Some of you know, and some of you have been in the Philippines. I think about Christians that sit there in hot churches, crammed in for hours on end. Why? Not because it's comfortable, but because they love God. I think about Christians in China who meet underground, who go different ways. Every time they go to church, they cannot sing. They cannot tell anybody where they go to church because they're afraid of their church being burnt to the ground. They're afraid of going to jail. They don't go to church because it's comfortable, because they're building a business, because they're making connections, because it's a good babysitting service. They go to church because they love God. And that ought to be why we come to church. And people say sometimes to me, uh, the weirdest things I hear, uh, I'm going to leave because I can't find a parking spot. Really? You don't love God enough to park in the dirt? Lord, help us. Go through the car wash. Amen. My family and I park in the dirt every Sunday. Prime Shine has a great deal. $20 a month, you can wash your car as many times as you want. Amen? You're, you don't love God enough to park your car somewhere you don't want. And I'm not just talking about parking in the dirt. I'm talking about parking down the street a little bit. We ought to love God more than that. Well, I'm preaching now. I didn't mean to do that. I'm just simply saying we ought to go to church because we love God, because we love Him. That's when we know there's an act of worship is when we go because we want our heart to be knit to God. Worship is an act of love for God. Number two, number two, if you're taking notes, worship is an act of reverence for God. Worship is an act of reverence for God. Let's take our Bibles and go to Philippians chapter number two. Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter 2. I love this passage of Scripture. One of my favorites, Philippians chapter 2. Just thinking about these words as we read them, it it sends chills up my spine as I read this. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things that are in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I say this, woe unto the flippant, irreverent, disrespectful kind of worship that's in the world today. Woe unto it. This is not the God that we serve. We do not serve a casual God. We do not serve a flippant God. We do not serve and worship buddy Jesus. No, thank you. No, we worship the King of Kings. 
We worship the Lord of Lords. We worship the master of the universe. That's who we worship. And when we come before him in our worship, we need to remember these things. Spirit-filled Christians. Listen, spirit-filled Christians know the spirit of God. We know because the spirit of God teaches us that God cares how Christ is worshiped. God cares. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, things that are in heaven, things that are on earth. He covers all the bases. Worship is an act of reverence for God. Do we reverence God? Do we give him the reverence that he deserves? Our worship should be reverential. Our worship should be a humble act of respect and awe for the creator and sustainer of the universe. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, our worship at this church should be reverent. Worship should never be a rock concert. You say, Pastor, that's preferential. It's irreverent. Worship is not a jazz festival. Worship is not a rap battle for Jesus. Worship is an act of reverence that brings honor and glory to an almighty God. There is an undercurrent in our culture today that is leading to an extreme, irreverent worship. This current does not lead to a sea of reverence and holiness, but a sea of worldliness and depravity. In our culture today, teenagers, if you don't understand what I'm saying, what I'm saying is is that there is a worship out there today that is leading churches and leading Christians to worship in depravity, not in reverence for God. We ought to stand before God with a reverent heart and worship Him. Some things that are taking places in churches across the country, I could not even include in my message tonight because there are children in the room. I wanted to show some pictures and talk about it tonight, but I will not because there are kids in the room. These things are happening in our churches across the country in a gross, filthy, irreverent worship in churches today. You say, well, that's extreme but it always starts somewhere. It always starts somewhere. And churches, listen, unfortunately are gobbling this stuff up and bringing it into the church and and forgetting that we are worshiping, we are reverencing a holy God. Peter says, be ye holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. How many of you tonight are sinners? Me too. I know that I'm not holy. But I understand the difference between unholy, irreverent worship and holy, reverent worship. There's a big difference, and the Holy Spirit teaches us that. When the sinful, unholy world is comfortable with our worship, it has ceased to be an act of reverential worship. It has become a pagan practice, bringing glory not to God, but to ourselves. And these things are being done in the name of grace and mercy and love. And God is certainly gracious and merciful and love. But my friends, God is holy. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That's the God that we serve. As the cultural current gets stronger and sweeps the world's Uh, culture farther out to sea, if you will. Listen to me carefully. Biblical worship is going to look stranger and stranger and stranger to the world. And that is okay. You say, well, we want the unchurched to be comfortable in our church to a certain degree. That is true. We want the air temperature to be just right. We want the seats to be soft. We want friendly people. We want sharp things. We want a message that makes sense. We want a staff that's friendly. And all God's people said, we want a clean, uh, well-functioning nursery. We want all of these things, and we want things to be comfortable. But our worship should not make sense to the unregenerate world. That is our worship to our God. We do not sacrifice our worship to make the world feel comfortable. That does not make sense. But that's what's happening today. And that's where irreverent, unholy worship comes from. 
And so for those of us that know Jesus Christ and are committed to his word, true truth and spirit-filled worship is as natural as breathing. I think of Brian over here who just got saved, man, about a year ago. And Brian, your music completely changed, didn't it? He's listening to all hymns now. It's as natural as breathing. The Holy Spirit of God in you should convict your heart what kind of worship you do. And I understand there are some preferences, and I understand there's some things that we all we might agree or disagree on. But we also understand that we all have the same Spirit of God in us, drawing us to a reverential worship to God. Worship is an expression of love for God, number one. It's an act of love that brings our heart closer to Him. When we uh, show God our love and worship, our heart is drawn closer. It also is an act of reverence for, to God and for God. And lastly tonight, worship is an act of personal and corporate dedication. Worship is an act of personal and corporate dedication. One last scripture to go to. Let's go to Acts chapter number 2, and I'll be done in just a moment. Acts chapter number 2, and look at verse 46 of Acts chapter 2. We know here in Acts 2, this is the first century church. And people like to say sometimes, well, what, what we do, what that, what, you know, this is not biblical and that's not biblical and, and what you do here and what you do there. You know, in the first century uh, church, there was no church building, right? Amen. There was no church building. They met house to house. Um, there was a lot of differences between their, what was going on with them and today. And so uh, we have a lot of things in our church that, that, that we do that you're not going to find in Acts chapter number two uh, that are just not there because, because they didn't have buildings at that time. They didn't assemble that way. But there are some things that the, uh, the first century church did that we need to be careful to consider. Look at verse 46. And they continued daily with one accord. That's not a car. They were uh, in unison. They continued daily in one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and with singleness of heart. Boy, they were together. They were excited about God. And look at verse 47, praising God. Boy, they had praise as a group. And having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We see the example here of the first century church to praise God corporately. We see that as a church, to praise God corporately. We also see that modeled in the Old Testament. How many times does the book of Psalms say, praise, O ye people, praise him in the congregation, praise him in his house. Psalms chapter 135 is such example. Verse 1, praise ye the Lord, praise ye the name of the Lord, praise him, O ye servants of the Lord. And ye stand in the house of the Lord and in the courts, in the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing, his, sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. Worship is an act of love and reverence and dedication to God. And this should be done both in our personal life and corporately as a church. The purpose of course, corporate worship, what is the purpose? We gather together as a church family, one with another. And what happens when we show our love uh, to God in front of each other? And what happens when we demonstrate our love and our dedication and our reverence to God around each other? It encourages the body. It strengthens the body. I don't know about you, but when I'm standing up here and you're singing these songs, it lifts my spirits. It encourages my heart. I remember being a little kid growing up in church, and they used to sing that song, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder, I'll Be There. And I remember, I remember hearing those men sing, Brother Renison, when the roll, and the ladies would sing this other part. I remember thinking as a kid, this is the coolest song in the world. And as a church, we come together and our, we, we, we want to do it generationally uh, from the grandparents, great-grandparents, all the way down to the little kids. We sing together. And what we're doing corporately is we are showing an act of worship to God in front of each other. And it strengthens the body of Christ. Boy, and that's such a wonderful thing to have in this day. How many of you starve, spiritually starve, when you're in the world? 
There is no spiritual. There is no God. There is no love for Christ in the world. There is hatred. There is, there is all kinds of issues and problems. And, and so when you come in here, it ought to be a place where you can worship God, where you can show acts of worship to Him. Corporate worship is expressed in unified love, in unified reverence, in unified dedication. God, we worship you. This is why we serve you. God, we worship you as a church. This is why we give to you. God, we worship you. We express our love and reverence and dedication to you together. God, we worship you. This is why we live holy. This is how we express our love and reverence to you. God, we worship you. This is why we sing. This is why we lift up our hearts in song towards you to bring honor and glory and praise to your name, God. We worship you. Corporate worship encourages the saints to love God and to live for him. So in closing tonight, what is the purpose of worship? Worship is an act of love for God, is an act of reverence for God. Worship is an act of personal and corporate dedication. I'll close with this quote by a man named Temple. His last name was Temple. And he says this. It's a little bit of a longer quote, but then I'll pray. For worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It is the quickening, or made alive, it is the quickening of conscience by His holiness. Worship is the nourishment of mind with His truth. It is the purifying of our imagination in His beauty. Worship is the opening of our heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purpose. Worship and all of this gathered up in adoration is the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable and therefore the chief remedy for that self-centeredness, which is our original sin and the source of all actual sin. How many recognize tonight that worship is something special? Let's pray together. Father, thank you, Lord, for worship. Thank you, Lord, that you've taught us through your spirit how to worship. With heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody's looking tonight. But I just ask you, as we close the service, do you know God? Do you know him? Have you ever come to Christ? Maybe you're sitting here today, and if I were to ask you, if you were to die today, do you have any idea where you'd be for eternity? Maybe you're here and you say, preacher, the answer to that question is, I know. I know I'm a Christian. I know Christ as my Savior. I've called upon him and trusted him as my Savior. Here's my hand, up and down, up and down, many hands. Maybe you're here tonight. And like Linnell, this last Wednesday night, who called upon Christ and was saved. And several of you in the recent years, and maybe this was 20 or 30 years ago or longer for you. But maybe you're here and you say, preacher, I've never called upon Christ. And I'd like to ask him to save me tonight. The Bible tells us that we're all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. That sin has broken our relationship with him. And so there's a need. You have a need in your life. You need a savior. The Bible tells us that God loved us so much, he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Maybe you'd like to trust Christ as your savior. The Bible says, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Do you believe in Christ? Call upon him tonight and ask him to save you. You can do that right in your seat. You can have someone come pray with you. Or maybe you're here and you say, preacher, I don't know that for sure. I don't know where I'm going when I die. Would you pray for me? Would you pray for me? Here's my hand. I won't embarrass you, but you say, that's me. Here's my hand. Anybody like that? I'm watching. Christians tonight, may we have a heart of worship. I just have one question for you tonight. Don't raise your hand. But in your heart, do you love God? Do you love God? Let's all stand together. The piano's playing. Would you just take a few minutes and pray and talk to the Lord? The altar's open for you if you'd like to come. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.
Father, we love you tonight. And certainly, Lord, tonight was an act of worship. And Lord, I pray that you draw our hearts closer to you. Thank you for your word and how it helps us in every area of life. May we walk close to you this week, God. May we please you, Lord, with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, thank you for listening. You may be seated. You listen so well. Let's watch a quick video of what's coming up next here at Central Valley. I'm Lydia and you're watching Up Next. We'd like to take a minute and let you know what's coming up at CVBC. If this is your first time visiting with us today, our church has a special gift for you. Please stop by the guest welcome banner in the lobby for your gift. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. The Married Couples Retreat is this week on Friday and Saturday, and we look forward to this exciting getaway. Dr. Toby Weaver will be our guest speaker. Come join us for a relaxing weekend in Monterey as we enjoy the beautiful sights and some delicious food. For more information and to register for the Married Couples Retreat, head to manteca.church events. You can also find more info in your service guide. Don't miss the Married Couples Retreat this Friday and Saturday. On November 23rd, the week of Thanksgiving, our midweek service will be moved from Wednesday to Tuesday. Come join us for a special Thanksgiving service and a play performed by our school, Central Valley Christian Academy. You won't want to miss this special service on Tuesday, November 23rd at 7 p.m. Thanks for watching. We look forward to seeing you soon at Central Valley Baptist Church. Together, and uh, the music of that uh, video for my new sermon series will change that. Amen. And so, uh, brother, I don't know where brother uh, Andrew is. We'll get that. Uh, we had another guy do that for us, so we're sorry about that. And I saw some of you start dancing though a little bit. Um, I want to encourage you to come to our married couples retreat that's coming up. And I'm super excited about that this week. And we have about 20 couples heading up there. And maybe you say, you know what, Pastor, we just we weren't sure we could go. And we're not sure if we can go, but we're going to try to make it. Uh, and if something changes last minute, it's okay. Just show up at the at the um, the event there. We'll have a great time together. But try to register if you can. But we'd love to have you go. You will not, you will not be disappointed, I promise you. It'll encourage your heart. We're going to meet up there. And we'll eat at a couple of different places together. Everyone's invited. Any married couple is invited to go. And we'd love to have, meet you up there. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. And thank you, Lord, for that uh, service, for the service tonight and all the music and everything that was done and just a blessing to our hearts. I pray that you'd be with us as we go our separate ways and keep us safe in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Amen.